Hi, it's Chris here. I'm excited to be giving a keynote at the summit, even if we can't all be together in person uh, this year uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, so the keynote today is entitled Risk 5 the next 10 years. So um, let's take a look and see what's going to happen. Uh, try and predict what will happen to Risk 5 in the next 10 years. First thing to note is that um, general purpose ISAs do last for decades. So if you go back and look at uh, the original instruction set architecture, the IBM 360, it's now 56 years old. That's kind of incredible. Um, Intel x86 is now 42 years old. Um, ARM is 35 years old and RISC V even is already 10 years old. Um, so these are not only been around for a long time, but they're still in active development. By that, I mean, people are building new hardware implementations in advanced technologies that are based around these instruction sets. So they're alive and very active development, even though they've been around for decades. Um, so these general purpose instruction sets do last for decades and we expect, we hope RISC-V will last for many decades more. What's interesting as I was putting this keynote together, I was thinking about special purpose instruction sets and how they don't seem to have that same property. So special purpose instruction sets do seem to come and go. Um, so array processors, network processors, image processors, DSPs, GPUs, AI accelerators. Now, what's interesting is the types of processor tend to persist, but it's rare for the actual hardware instruction set to last more than a decade or so in each of these areas. And there's multiple reasons for that. Um, one is just that naturally things that are specialized try to take the best advantage of technology at a time. And when technology moves along, the instruction set doesn't really scale to the, the newer technology. Another thing is in some areas, the um, general purpose processors catch up and there's less of a need, or they add extensions that capture the, the, the optimizations these special purpose ISAs would bring. But it's kind of interesting that these specialized processors don't tend to last for, uh, the hardware ISAs don't tend to last for a long time, even if the type of processor does um, keep going. Um, one other thing to look at is just what happened in the last 10 years. And I think from an architecture perspective, it's interesting to look back and um, just see how much actually happened. I think it's very easy to think things move slowly until you look back and then you see how much has happened, really happened in the, the relatively short amount of time. For example, you know, deep learning wasn't a thing 10 years ago. It's hard to believe given how dominant this topic is across the whole industry, hardware and software applications, that it just wasn't a thing 10 years ago. So, you know, the, probably the, the thing that was really the breakout um, paper for uh, deep learning was the AlexNet paper that came out in 2012. Um, that's less, way less than 10 years ago. Um, another area that's uh, sort of more frightening is um, whole new classes of security challenge appeared. It was only a few years ago that Meltdown and Spectre burst onto the scene. And um, both these topics are new in the last 10 years, and these are really now the primary topics of research in the architecture community. So things change pretty fast. And one of the fun things about computer architecture, why I like it so much, is that there's always new things to look at and there's always new designs to do and there's always new topics. Um, and it's always right at the center of the computing industry. Um, so looking ahead um, to the next 10 years, well, some predictions I can make that are pretty easy to make are that there will be new security threats, but I don't know what they'll be. Um, Another pretty safe prediction to make is that there'll probably be some new application areas, but we don't know what those will be either. Um, and another prediction I will make, this may be a little less uh, clear, is that I think we will need to start on the RISC V 120 bit address space definition in the next decade. Um, I think um, if I remember back to the early 90s, I remember when MIPS came out with the R4000 with a 64 bit address space. And at that time, people are thinking, well, we don't, it's going to be a long time before we need 64 bits. But um, the smarter people had realized, you know, there was this uh, continuing growth in storage capacity. And it takes a long time to bring up new compilers, tools, operating systems to handle a wider address space. So MIPS kind of got ahead of the curve in putting out 64 bit at that time. And if you look now, people have 64 bit processors in their wristwatches. Okay, so I think. This decade, we're going to see 128-bit become, we have to start working on it because it's going to involve quite major changes in all the tool chain, um, much more so than the 32 to 64-bit transition involved. And so I think we're going to um, see some serious work towards the end of the decade in bringing up 128-bit uh, um, address spaces. 
They may not work the same as the 32 to 64 bit, who knows, but I, I'm pretty sure we're gonna need more than 64 bits of address space. Thankfully, we've at least thought of that in RISC-5, and so we have a place to start, but it's gonna take a lot of work to bring that up. Um, so another prediction I can make safely for the next 10 years is that RISC-V is going to increase adoption throughout all the computing. Um, I think the, the dual, um, the double whammy here is it's a free and open architecture, so anybody can adopt it freely. Everybody gets a free architecture license. But also we tried to make it a simple and modular design so it can adapt to these challenges, new application areas, new security challenges. Um, the simplicity helps there, the modularity helps in adding things. So I think um, these are reasons why I think it's natural to predict that RISC-V is just going to keep increasing adoption. Um, there's going to be new specialized processes. There always has been, there always will be, there'll be new ones. But I think the change will be that um, given the way um, things are going, they'll be more based on RISC-V rather than specialized and proprietary bases. One of the reasons there were a lot of uh, different ISAs for specialized processes is there was not a free and open standard one people could easily use that made a good base for these specialized processes. But now RISC-5, there's something that's designed to be, um, can be pared down to be very simple to act as the base of a custom accelerator. And so I think you're gonna see more specialized processes based on RISC-V rather than on um, some other base ISA. So these are kind of easy predictions for the next 10 years. Um, uh, so talking about RISC-V adoption, the reason I'm, I'm so gung-ho that it will be adopted more and more throughout computing is just the tremendous momentum we have right now. And so our modest goal that we, we set a long time ago was that we would just become the industry standard ISA for all computing devices. And originally that was really just a, um, uh, uh, almost a joke that yes, of course we will, um, but it's become true um, and it's really happening. And we see this is happening much faster in more domains than anybody ever predicted. Um, and there's demand for every performance level from very low to ludicrous, I like to say. Um, and there's demand for basically every feature of every ISA ever built. So, so everybody wants to use RISC-V everywhere. And so there's tremendous demand uh, to use it. And I think what's, what's interesting with RISC-V is we're trying to do all this with a new model, uh, which is a community developed uh, instruction set specification. And so obviously there's been a lot of challenges just in how to do that uh, with a community versus the standard model of a single company owning and driving the development of the ISA. So just to recap on you know, how we run RISC-V, how does the ecosystem work? So at the center of the ecosystem, you have the RISC-V International. So RISC-V International is really um, uh, an open standards body that manages the ISA specification. And the main um, product from RISC-V International is the specification itself, the go-to model and compliance suites. Um, and this specification for the ISA, that provides the standard that's the interface between software and hardware. And so the RISC-V ecosystem, um, is built around this ISA that lives in the middle. So the nice thing about having an open specification is that it enables open source cores to exist. And we've seen a great proliferation of open source cores. Um, you know, again, all corners of the planet producing uh, RISC-V cores, um, you know, students, uh, high school students even making their own RISC-V cores. Anybody can build these um, and it's become a standard project for people to do. Um, and there's uh, more and more capable cores being available, some being used in commercial products. But uh, RISC-V is not only about open source cores. There's also a large number of commercially supported cores as well um, from a growing number of providers. And in fact, and the all around the world again. And in fact, already RISC-V has more um, commercial core IP providers than any other instruction set in history. Um, and as well as open source cores or commercial cores, because everybody gets an architectural license and can build their own core, uh, companies are building their own RISC-V cores to use internally. For example, NVIDIA is shipping all their GPUs now with RISC-V on there as controllers. So many, many providers of uh, RISC-V implementations, uh, many places to do this, and many people providing compatible standard hardware. And to run out of hardware, you need software. And so really the crown jewel of RISC-V is the software ecosystem that's building up around the standard interface. And that software ecosystem includes both the open source uh, community that has um, uh, wholeheartedly embraced RISC-V. So upstream projects from GCC, Linux, uh, BSD, a whole range of upstream projects are now embraced RISC-V as a mainstream supported architecture. But it, again, it's not only about open source software, there's also commercial software. So there's a large number of companies who are supporting um, RISC-V commercially, uh, both with their own products and also supporting, uh, providing support for the open source software uh, for RISC-V. 
So this is the RISC-V ecosystem. It's big and growing. It's very vibrant, a lot of activity. And this is how we organize it. So a standard in the middle, an open standard in the middle, and then uh, both open source and commercial hardware and software. Now, with such a big community, one of the challenges we have is in managing diversity at RISC-V International. So, um, you know, one thing is people want to use RISC-V everywhere, and a single fixed ISA spec cannot, cannot work, possibly work for all domains. Um, and we envisaged this when we designed RISC-V, so it was designed to be modular. We have different base ISAs for 32-bit, 64-bit, 120-bit address space. We have a set of different standard extensions that are optional, um, everything from single double precision floating point and an increasing set of optional standard extensions. And then we leave aside some space for vendors to add their own custom extensions. So projects, um, commercial providers can add their own custom extensions that are not managed in any way by the, the central organization. Um, and the idea is you can combine these modules to build your own application specific instruction set. Um, so that's great, you have the flexibility. Uh, the challenge is that across the software and toolchain ecosystem, it can be difficult to, to actually support any combination of all these uh, pieces um, uh, well. So, um, uh, you know, at some point it becomes a responsibility of the, the implementer to support the software, but they also want to draw upon as broad a range of support as they can from the, the standard ecosystem. Um, a second aspect of uh, managing development here is we have a very large community with a lot of interests. And um, it's been great to see all these good ideas, all the task groups started at the Foundation International, but it's uh, really important for us to prioritize and finish things um, to make RISC V successful. So that's been really a theme the last year or so is, is working on prioritizing and finishing things. Um, so the technical steering committee in the new organization has been um, trying to focus the short term effort we have on uh, trying to meet the needs of at least a few application domains completely. And so looking at what are the gaps in the RISC-V ISA, that means they cannot be used in these domains, or as well, what are the opportunities? What are things that um, uh, would really enable RISC-V to take a lead in these different uh, application domains? And so really what is needed for a complete and compelling solution to uh, some of these application domains? Now, one of the ways we're structuring uh, this, this focus is around the idea of architecture profiles. So profiles are something we've talked about a lot at the foundation and RISC-V International the last uh, five years or so, but it's really kind of crystallizing now that what we really are talking about are architecture profiles and we've been um, uh, coming up with a naming strategy for these. And so uh, the two initial architecture profiles will be RVA19 and RVM19, and that represents the application processor profile for year 2019 and the microcontroller profile for 2019. And the idea of these profiles only include ratified extensions at the date of their creation of the profile. And each profile specifies the mandatory base and extensions needed to meet that profile, as well as what are optional extensions within that profile, as well as what standard extensions are not actually considered supported within that um, profile. So that the, the idea here is you want to reduce complexity for um, the software ecosystem and RISC-V users by giving a sort of more understandable um, synopsis of what's in a given core or a given uh, hardware platform. And so the, um, the idea is that the, the mandatory base extensions um, have to be present in all the implementations. Um, there can be some optional standard extensions, but also there are some extensions that we're not expecting to support. And so this kind of simplifies life for the software ecosystem, knowing that these things are not meant to be combined in a, say an application processor or in a microcontroller, a microcontroller processor. And so the technical steering committee at RISC V is going to be deriving uh, this future roadmap for the future architecture profiles. And our plan is uh, to do the next one. So I should say the RVA 19 are supposed to be built on the existing things already ratified. And we want to go back and retrofit these, and these are still in development, and release those so we have a very clear model of what's in a, a standard RISC V microcontroller, for example, for 2019. Um, but we're going to drive forward to add new features, new capabilities, and the next target is uh, by next summit to have RVA21 and RVM21 developed um, for the next summit. So you'll be hearing a lot more about uh, these architecture profiles um, from the, the RISC-V International. Uh, one other thing to clarify, profiles versus platforms. Um, the architecture profiles standardize the ISA components visible to software, and that's both privileged and unprivileged uh, components. Um, whereas platform standards really are more about um, the set of hardware implementation choices, a broader range of things, including the supported ISA, but including things like how a system boots, how its memory is configured, what are allowable memory configurations, 
how the system does discovery, device handling, debug, and attach, et cetera. So they're kind of more about a given implementation, whereas the architecture profile is really about the software view of the instruction set uh, on that system. Uh, so both of these are very important. We'll be developing both of these uh, to help uh, bring the community together around some common, um, common standards. Um, another thing that will follow is a focus on ver verticals in industry. Um, so the uh, architecture profile is really a generic uh, for a class of processor, but we also want to look at certain industry areas that may need additional specialized support. And so the technical steering committee is going to be prioritizing how we add extensions based on member interest. We cannot do everything at all at once to high quality. And so the goal is to, amongst the membership, figure out what are the priorities and try and focus the, the, the group's efforts on getting those things defined and, and ready for uh, commercial use. Um, and this may involve enhancing the profiles or adding more profiles even uh, to support different industry verticals. So this is another activity going on uh, at the RISC-5 International. So just to summarize, there's a quick keynote. Um, so next 10 years, um, there's going to be new application areas and there's going to be new demands for security dependability. Um, and really, a free and open, simple, modular ISA is really the best way of meeting these challenges. Um, so that's why we believe RISC V is going to be uh, thrive in the next 10 years and be widely adopted. Um, and we're trying to organize RISC V International to help manage this upcoming complexity as RISC V is going to spread to lots more application areas and we're going to have even more members and contributors. Just to like to thank everybody who's been helping out on the way so far. It's been great to see this community just really blossom and grow. Okay, that's all I have time for today. So um, I hope to see you soon in person sometime not too far away.